All right, th great, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm happy to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing with added manufacturing north of Grumman. I kind of try to tie in a little bit in this presentation what we're doing with computational design. Uh, we've been an NTOP user for, for years now, and we've really explored what we can do with the tool, um, really push the boundaries of what we can do with uh, end topology. So it's, it's been exciting uh, being part of that journey. So a little deeper, uh, Northrop Grumman, for those that aren't that familiar with what we do as a company, a uh, wide range of applications. I'm actually from Space Systems, so we have multiple sectors. I'll really be telling you more about the perspective of our Space Systems added manufacturing. As, as a whole, we really try to find the most challenging problems and really um, define possible through the solutions that we bring to bear on those. So most of you are probably familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope, really cool uh, scientific instrument, one of the probably greatest marvels of engineering achievement out there, taking some really amazing science data. Proud to say I worked on it for about a decade, helping it uh, come into existence. So understanding that aspect of uh, performance design and really maximizing what we can get out of, out of a space system, uh, there's nothing better to point at than James Webb. Uh, across our space portfolio, a little broader than just uh, telescopes, though we uh, work in space security, missile warning and defense, exploration and science, where James Webb comes in, satellite communications, uh, deterrence, mobility and logistics, and space launch and more. So wide uh, vertical integration of space uh, systems is in our space portfolio. Uh, really, we're kind of organized uh, into different uh, operating businesses within the space portfolio tackling those, uh, those mission spaces. Uh, I'm with our Strategic Space Systems Division, mostly based out of uh, Redondo Beach, local here to Southern California. Uh, we also have a Tactical Space Systems Division and Payload and Ground Systems. I work on a lot of different things based across uh, the country. So a heavy presence in Arizona, uh, Virginia, Colorado, uh, Utah, and more. Out of our launch and strategic missiles, um, that's where you'll find um, a lot of the other types of space systems. So, uh, so with specifically for added manufacturing, we've been working with added for over 20 years now. Um, I've been working with Adam myself for over 10 years. Uh, we're really looking at how to drive design flexibility, improve the performance of our parts, uh, achieve cost reductions and uh, reductions in lead time, but also at times looking for performance and, and weight savings. Uh, so the pic part pictured there uh, was designed for a flight program. Fortunately, that program never flew, but it was a part that was baseline to go into space. So as you can imagine, it was weight optimized. You can see that in the topology optimization of the structure. Um, so really looking at those sorts of transformative changes, not just on structural parts, but um, on things like radio frequency related parts, sensors, engines, hypersonic systems, and more. And so we, we do a lot of collaboration uh, with small businesses and qualifying uh, various types of capabilities for, for space. It's really trying to define what's possible with additive and expanding not just the available material uh, systems and catalog that we can make parts from, but also how we apply it uh, with things like computational design. So I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of some of the technologies that we've worked with. Uh, uh, really, when we think about computational design and what's printable with complex structures, a small metal added in manufacturing, what comes to most people's mind. Uh, so with this, uh, we've done a lot with uh, powder bed fusion systems, both electron beam and laser, uh, and a lot of different material families. So we've uh, been looking at titanium, aluminum, uh, cobalt and nickel based alloys, uh, low expansion alloys, and copper. And this really gives us a wide toolbox of the types of um, different characteristics of the materials and the applications you can use them in. So you can imagine with copper, for example, being used more in thermal and electrical products as opposed to aluminum and titanium being more used in structural products. And so the types of optimization and that we're doing with that, especially feeding into a tool like NTOP, is going to be different. We're looking at different physics, different objectives. We start thinking about things like the triply periodic minimal surfaces and the different types of cellular structures you can apply to the design. We're not necessarily looking at the exact same workflow uh, every time. It's not always a structural optimization. Sometimes it is a fluid uh, thermal uh, optimization. So really trying to, to consolidate parts and then put in those types of functionalization within the parts. And NTOP has been uh, really great for trying to achieve that. Um, the part in the upper right is an example of consolidating multiple parts that did not have a need uh, for cellular type structures in the part. But nonetheless, it's a, an example of a part that uh, topology optimization plays really well for. Okay, looking a little bit bigger in scale. So when we say large, we're really talking larger than two feet in two dimensions. So there's some systems that go up to three or four feet in, in one direction. We're really talking things that get big in two directions. Uh, really, this has been focused with our additive world more on uh, forging type replacement. So looking at processes that tend to have a little bit thicker of a paintbrush, if you can imagine. So a lot of 
the complexity and these types of parts will be added in uh, after the additive process. Um, still a lot of opportunity here looking at how computational design can drive uh, larger scale structural optimization and integration of, of additive into that workflow. And then I'll move on to polymers and composites. So we've done a lot with polymer additive technologies, uh, many different types. So and most people are familiar with material extrusion, uh, stratasys printers, for example. We do a lot of that, rapid prototyping. Um, but we're also starting to get into making more flyaway type products with material extrusion. Uh, you can see examples of some smaller parts, like on the upper right there. Uh, that's not an actual part that flew. That was really just a demonstration part for qualifying the technology. Uh, but we see things from uh, covers, guards, tooling, tertiary type structures with polymers and not as high performance as metallics. But it also means there is opportunity to lightweight them in, in different ways. They have different types of load paths and, and considerations on them. Uh, some of the most interesting technology we have in the composites realm is our scalable composites robotic additive manufacturing. Uh, this opens up some really interesting opportunities from a design perspective. Uh, as you're dealing with two things with this capability. One, it's continuous fiber additive manufacturing. So you have highly anisotropic structures with, with extremely high performance in one direction where the fibers are going. And so we get into challenges with design perspective of how do you optimize the fiber paths in 3D space when you can do things like topology optimization to, to achieve where those paths can actually be placed. So the scram printer really changes the design envelope and perspective of composite structures. Uh, and also with that scram printer, you can print um, neat or chop fiber filled plastics at the same time. So working with multiple materials effectively and highly anisotropic materials in a way that something like computational design is absolutely necessary to, to really um, engineer uh, incredible performance composite structures. So uh, as you can imagine, we've uh, worked with NTOP in some ways with related to the scram technology. Uh, one example of that product is on the, the lower right there in which we did evaluate uh, the different ways of using NTOP to realize such a structure. That's an example for, that's uh, not super recent, so we've done more with it since then. And so some of the challenges we've been dealing with, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on these sections. Uh, these charts are, some of them are from another presentation, but just interesting perspective is more on how are we doing with adopting additive manufacturing? What are some of our barriers there to realizing we're trying to do from a design perspective, actually get it into flyaway type products. And I'm really talking a little bit beyond engines. So everybody's seen plenty, lots of examples of, of using added manufacturing for engines. Saw some examples and pictures today. Uh, we're dealing with challenges of qualification and validation. So qualifying the technology that we've been able to print with them and then fly the amazing parts that we can design. Um, one aspect that comes in uh, with things like cellular lattice structures and, and TPMS type structures is the inspection. So figuring out how to inspect those parts effectively. Not, not sure uh, when we're gonna solve that, that challenge, but uh, it's interesting to think about the back end, right? We can design these amazing structures with computational design, but we still need to be able to validate them to, to actually be able to fly them in a high performance application. Uh, so that's gonna be one barrier that we have to overcome uh, to really realize uh, what these tools enable, um, especially when you're trying to think about putting them in more critical type applications. A couple other challenges are really around standards and unification. Uh, one aspect I wanna highlight from this chart is really design for additive producibility. So again, figuring out how to get the end top created file uh, that can be printed and actually consistently do that by every designer without really increasing the, the burden of iterations to get a printable result. Um, that's one thing we've been looking at, how we integrate that more into the workflow and training the workforce. Uh, we've had challenges with, with obsolescence in the supply chain, and this isn't quite as relevant to the computational design side, but um, things like material changes, uh, machine obsolescence, how we maintain qualified capability to continue printing the types of parts that we'd like to keep printing. And so there's a couple imperatives uh, there that we think will help deliver on the potential of additive manufacturing and enable the complex designs to really start being produced. Uh, one is that commodity and material systems really need to become truly more like commodities. So. Uh, more open sharing of data, uh, so suppliers all running uh, consistently the same type of approach and same methods and processes on the machines um, so that uh, it really normalizes uh, the supply chain. That also helps uh, kind of inform the need for supply chains to become more predictable. So uh, with that unification, we can move parts between builds and get the outcomes that are expected. So while we've been able to design some of these really complex parts, sometimes we go to get things printed and they don't print obviously exactly the way that we hoped. And so, and sometimes that varies by supplier. 
So we really like to, to have this become more predictable where the designs coming out of NTOP not, are just, not just printable by one person, but printable by everybody and consistently printable. That also goes back to the inspection side. So um, lots of demonstrated value. Really, we've really been excited about what we can do with uh, computational design in the NTOP tool suite. Um, but some things that really we need to see change before we really start seeing high levels of adoption and lots of different types of parts for additive manufacturing. Okay. Uh, so what's sort of next for us with Space Systems in Northrop Grumman? A couple of things. We're going to keep pioneering new materials and applications. We're going to keep exploring what we can do with computational design to really push the performance envelope of those parts, uh, cre you know, really creating those novel ways of using additive to create value. And there's a couple other highlights uh, on the slides here, mostly more related to large additive manufacturing. So some of the work with uh, you know, up to 20 foot or larger type structures that we're printing, which is sort of a different uh, area of additive than polymer and, and metal powder bit fusion. So I'll end there, and if we have time, I think for a couple of questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sure, let me go back to that slide so you can see it. So that was actually a, a polymer powder bit fusion part. And so part of what we were doing there was, uh, so the question was related to explain more of the failure and what we're seeing there, right? So we actually had high speed video as you can imagine on this. And so uh, basically it was just capturing the failure of, of it. And you can see it's a fairly brittle plastic. So it shatters into multiple pieces and High speed video really helped us identify where the part was breaking and exactly how predictable it was to the simulation. Mm -hmm. and the one of them and not the other. Can you talk about what failed? I can't really talk about specific examples there, uh, but it's just sometimes we get different results. Say like if you're looking at tensile specimens, right, where you're seeing differences on the same machine across different suppliers. There's been many examples of that that we've seen in industry where you don't necessarily get the same outcome. Or also the, um, all the aspects of setting up a build, you know, the way the support structures are done, the exact orientation of the part, some of that's left open to the different providers to determine, right? So you don't necessarily have exactly the same build file going to each vendor. Are you blaming that on the design, the computational design? Or? I, don't, I don't think that's so much on the computational design side, but the more integrated things get, and I mean, obviously the panel up here talking about the integration of it to you know, simulate the build and kind of standardize everything, I think will help. You mentioned, you mentioned, oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned the challenge being uh, inspection. What do you guys do for, um, you might be looking for me, I don't know, I'm right Oh, there you are. Uh, what do you guys do for inspection when you have complex lattice structures? I mean, right now the approach has been to try to use CT scanning and really just get the best resolution we can out of it. Obviously that works at kind of maybe smaller scales. I, I, I'd say we don't really have a great approach. You know, right now mostly it's a lot of the ways that those TPMS structures are being used in our sort of performance driven type applications. So part testing, you know, for functionality is really the best approach at least at this point. But it would be nice to be able to do a more affordable or quicker uh, inspection of parts before getting into, you know, setting up uh, performance testing on part. Anybody else? Yeah, one more. I'd be curious uh, what, what sort of situations you have that need a, lot of, need a lot of those types of simulations to help design something optimally? Uh, yeah, I mean, some of it comes into, say, propulsion type products where you're, you're looking at, you know, really actively trying to manage um, temperatures in different areas of the parts, managing fluid control and fluid flow. Uh, comes up in places like that, and things like heat exchangers, um, cold plates, those types of applications, you know, for, for thermal type fluids. Thank you. Yep. Great. Well, I think I'm out of time. So appreciate the, the chance to speak. Thank you. Mm -hmm.